Uh, we have a rock star panel here. We have the uh, VP of uh, North American Sales for Zendesk, uh, the VP of Enterprise uh, Business for Twilio, and uh, Bob Tinker, Tinker co-founder of Mobile Iron and author of Survival to Thrival. Um, this lineup can basically answer any and all sales questions you guys have ever will have. Um, I have a list of questions that I have collected um, from uh, my accelerator that I've put together, um, but I do actually want to leave a little bit of time for, um, which I didn't talk to you guys about, but I assume it'll probably be okay, um, for some questions from you guys from the audience to make sure we're, we're hitting the, the notes that you guys really want to hear about. Um, we've already all known that I have a bad short-term memory, uh, so I'm going to pull up my notes. Um, so where I'd like to start, actually, and I think it's a really important thing, especially since we have a lot of founders in the audience. Um, a lot of founders, when they start their career, don't think that sales is going to be one of the core components of success for their jobs. Um, I know I personally, when I, went to, uh, when I was in college, I didn't think I was going to go into sales, and I found my passion in it and love it. Um, and so I wanted to ask each of you guys, why sales? Um, why are you doing sales? I mean, obviously, Bob, you're, you're CEO, but sales is part of the job. And, um, like, what do you guys enjoy about it? Obviously, the money is pretty good, but <laughs> I assume it's not it's the not, money. Yeah, it's <laughs> not the money, actually. In fact, I probably should admit this, but I've been at Zendesk for almost two years, and I've not looked at my exactly commissions one time, <laughs> ever. I don't actually worry about it because I'm not. I'm not actually driven by that. Um, this is actually a question I ask a lot of um, early people in their careers when we're hiring STRs, and I coach my managers to ask. I said, well, why does this person want to get into sales? And if they say money, it's like an immediate red flag for me. Um, it, it's not really about that. I think for me, <clears throat> I'm very competitive. So when people say, hey, I'm in sales because I'm competitive, well, what does that mean to you? right? And when someone says, I played sports, I'm like, mm, I played with a lot of people in sports that weren't super competitive. But for me, like I had to have the most stars in math class. I had to have the most of everything and anything I ever did. Um, so when I was exposed to sales, I realized that I love to win. So for me, I think for salespeople, I look for people who love to win or hate to lose. Um, you have to be careful with the hate to lose people because they don't celebrate the wins. They expect to win, so they don't celebrate them. They're very upset when they lose, but they don't celebrate the wins. So you have to be conscious of that, but um, I. I love to win, so sales is a great role for me. I would I would agree with that definitely. Um, for me, it's also about just the the day to day composition of my world is so varied, and and because I get to talk to customers and I'm in the field with my reps, with my team, with product people, with founders. Um, it, the variety is really interesting and we basically are building a and we're trying new material all the time so it it's extremely um dynamic and it just keeps me going and um i think that's kind of to the competitive spirit that i have but it's also that ultimately you know i'm i'm in sales i've built lots of teams, divisions, um, you get to create the vision and the story and make it interesting for your customers every day. And that's not something that every role in a company uh, gets to do. So I enjoy that. Hi, everyone. Um, like a lot of Silicon Valley founders, I backed into sales. Um, I started off as a product-centric founder, like a lot of technology startups do. And when I look back through the rearview mirror, like on the top five list of things that I wish somebody had told me when I was an early stage founder, is uh, that sales stuff is really important. Uh, the thing I didn't realize until I was into it is it's also really fun. Um, the, uh, and it's a little bit of a bug in Silicon Valley, actually. I think we're really good at building products. We're fundamentally a product shop. I don't think we do as good a job helping entrepreneurs understand how to build go to markets and sales on top of those products, which is why I actually love that we're doing this event tonight. Awesome. Thanks, Bob. Uh, I can't tell you how many VCs I sit in conversations with, and that's exactly what they say. Mm -hmm. The founder who loves to sell is one of the things I actually look for. So that's just a little tip for you guys. Um, so uh, one of the things that I want to talk about uh, a little bit 
Um, Mandy uh, gave a great talk on uh, scaling up your, your business, um, you know, past your t first 10 customers and how to go about doing that. But we have such a rock star team here um, with so, so much experience. I actually um, want to ask Allison and Jamie, what attracted you to your current positions? Um, you're in two years, so you can actually remember you know, where it was. I've, ha I've had conversations with both of you a little bit about it. Um, and then Bob, when you hired your VP of sales at Mobileye, what were you looking for and how did you know they were a great culture fit? So um, I'll start I'll, with I'll kick it off with, uh, so I joined Twilio two years ago and um, I did in between, I was at Akamai Technologies for 15 years and then I did a startup in a totally different industry, which was great experience, worked with the, I was the first time sales leader, the founders had sold their 10 deals and we were pre-revenue, so I um, had that opportunity to build, but I didn't realize that I was gonna miss loving the platform and loving a technology. So I went back and started my search again and said I really wanna find a company that's going through this transformation of recognizing that they've built this awesome, frictionless, self-service platform that's a great product by a great product leader and they don't really need sales. They've acquired all of these customers, they're operating, um, their net expansion rate was huge. But I, I knew at some point they would need enterprise leadership. And um, so I kind of took it as a challenge, like let me see if we can convince the founders and the, uh, the team that we actually need to talk to our customers in certain ways to um, tell the stories and simplify the message and give re recommendations so that they don't make mistakes um, even though we provide a really great um, onboarding experience through the, the technical documentation. So for me, it was, it was that, that challenge and then also just finding a platform. We focus on creating really engaging experiences for our customers. And that is so broad and has applicability to any, I can't think of one company that doesn't have communications in some form. So for me, it was like, I know there's a market here. I know I can make money, which it is for me a little bit about money. Um, yeah, it has to be for you too. Yes, well, yes. But I still <laughs> haven't looked at exactly. <laughs> okay, um, so anyway, that's my, my reason why with Twilio is platform, um, prove them wrong, let's, that, you know, sales does actually, um, exist for a reason and that and good enterprise um, sales organizations can help move the needle um, and so far that's been really fun great um, so for me and I think this is something when you guys are looking for your sales leaders to look at too is that I know what I'm what I'm good at and what I like so I like being in a, in a business that it has is transactional but that I can also go, I can go bottoms up and I know how to build that business, but I also can just build out the enterprise top down as well. So whether, you know, Fortune 500, Zendesk can sell to that, we can also sell to lots of startups and maybe some of you guys are customers as well. Um, we have a pretty, pretty large customer base. So for me, it was a nice sweet spot because I got to utilize the enterprise skills and really go up and market. They didn't really have a field team. They didn't have an SDR team. All really Zendesk had when I started was an inside sales team. I'm like, all right, well, I've done that. I know how to do that. I know how to build the field organization. I know how to build the SDR organization to feed it. So I could keep the inside sales team going, but then build up the enterprise business. And we've really made a big impact over the last year. So I think when you're looking for a sales leader, it's like, what kind of background do they have? Are they top down enterprise, seven figure deals, year long sales cycle, or is your product? less than three months sales cycle and do you need to lean in more on inside sales so i think it's important to to look at what is their background what kind of sales do they drive can they drive enterprise if you need it or can they do they really know how to run an effective uh inside sales organization too so that that's what i looked for the uh so uh i'll take the the, the sort of part b of the question whitney gave me which is when we we're building mobile iron and it was time to hire the first VP of sales. Sort of how do I think about that? Um, there's actually a really important piece of advice that I would give uh, startup founders, which is uh, one of the mistakes sort of the venture capital community does when you sort of find your first five or 10 customers, they say, okay, time to go start sales. Go hire a VP of sales. <laughs> that is the wrong thing to do. Don't do that. Uh, I personally think the better answer there is to go hire uh, Davy Crockett. Um, if you look at sort of the what sales is really doing in the very beginning, is sort of finding your path through the woods. 
How do you find sort of that repeatable path through the woods? And there's some trails you're going to go down that don't work. There's some that work. They're kind of making stuff up. They chuck a little bit to the left, chuck a little bit to the right. They got a little bit of marketing in them. They're a little bit producty. Um, you need to have sort of Davy Crockett in the building before you can go hire Joan of Arc or Braveheart. So you know they're like Joan of Arcs here. Um, and you know, interestingly, when you go hire sort of Joan of Arc or Braveheart, the first thing they're going to want to do is talk to your Davy Crockett because no grade A VP of sales is going to be the first salesperson in the building. Just not going to happen. <laughs> so you know, getting Davy Crockett and sort of finding the path through the woods is the number one thing sort of a grade A VP of sales is going to look for. Um, Beyond that, sort of if you think about sort of the personality characteristics of a Joan of Arc or Braveheart, what is it about them that makes them really good? It's number one, they really believe in what you're doing and they're excited about it because it's a hard job. Uh, two is they need to be able to rally an army to their cause and run down the path and beat the shit out of the enemy, right? So there's a real high sort of tribal leader, sort of go get them kind of attitude that needs to be there. And then, the th you know, and that's sort of both sort of attitude and talent sort of built into there. And the third one, which I'd agree with what they said, is they need to sort of fit what you think your sales motion is going to be. Like they need to be sort of a good fit for that. Are you large enterprise sales, they know how to do that? Or are you going to do frictionless zero touch sales like Twilio? Like those are two really different go to market motions and making sure that your sales leader fits that. Um, the last thing is just make sure they're going to be a good leader around the executive table because they're going to have a really loud voice and have a big impact on culture. Um, hiring your first grade A VP of sales will be an inher inherently uncomfortable experience for you and the rest of the team. If it's not, you probably didn't hire the right person because their job is to actually push you and push the team. And it's going to change the culture. Uh, it's going to be awkward, but that's actually a good thing. Awesome. Um, so the next question I have is, so uh, Jamie and Ellison, when you guys joined your organizations, um, and the, again, separate conversations I've had with both of them about this, and I really appreciated their approach, so I think it's an important thing to share. Um, when you guys joined Twilio and Zendesk, uh, how did you guys go about figuring out what your jobs were? outside of hitting the numbers because um, obviously there's revenue targets that you need to hit but there's a lot of other holes you have to fill in in the process um, and I, so I'd be curious for you guys how you guys went about that because you guys both have individual conversations with this and I, I know Bob you're gonna have some, some, some insights to share on this as well so I just kind of want to direct that, com that question out sure um, so, I mean, so obviously, the, uh, of course, it's I have a quota, and I have to hit the quota. Um, but when I got in, there was a quota that I wasn't quite sure how was set. So I asked, well, where is the bottoms-up model? And they said, there is no bottoms-up model. I'm like, okay, because if there's one thing you know, if you go in as a VP of sales and there's no bottoms-up model, you're kind of effed and fired, and sometimes it's yeah, in that order, right? So I was a little nervous, and so I'm like, okay, so the first thing I need to do is model out um, what can we actually do, right? So I, I, my job is to hit the number, but I have to make sure I have the right troops on the field. Do I have all the right types of roles in the right geographies, all that kind of stuff? Then how much productivity can I get out of each person, right? What is my current expansion rate? What's my new business? Is my new business going up or is it going down? What's my expansion rate? Is it going up or going down? Is the productivity rate reasonable per rep? Or do I really need to look at improving that, right? Do I have the right sales tools in place to, for all my teams? So I had to look at that because we had a hodgepodge of tools. I think we're in better shape now um, than we were a year, year and a half ago. Um, but it, it was, it was people's, it was like, it was product, people, and process, right? Those were kind of my job. Where was the product? Were we selling it to the right, um, places within the market, right? Was it internal use cases? Do we put more energy there? Do we stay focused on B2C where we're really strong, second by B2B, and then internal? So it's kind of product questions I had to make sure I was answering. There's process. We didn't have a sales process, right? I had no qualification methodology. 
Um, when people said it was in stage three, it could mean 10 different things. So I'd go into a forecast call and I'd be like, why is this in commit? Like, you have no access to the economic buyer. You don't know if they are even going to have budget. You don't have a champion. Like, you're not going to get through the legal process. So why is this in commit? Well, I realized we didn't have a common language, right? So process had to be worked out. We worked out a common language sale process. We put in MedPEC. That really helped us out a lot in our deals. Um, and then for um, the people side, did I have all the right players? Um, and was I measuring them correctly? And you know, in some cases, I didn't. And I had to make some make some changes on the on the people front too. So then, kind of came down to my job. I look at it like the three P's: people, process, product, and the sales wrapper that you kind of put around that. It's really interesting. So Steve Johnson, who is the CRO of Hootsuite, had the exact same three things when I interviewed him a while back. Interesting. Sorry, I just I was. I swear I did not know that <laughs> or talk to him. He's awesome. Anyway, you guys, should, you should talk to him. It's great. Oh, we run out of it. Oh, no, we're good. Okay. Can we live without it? Yeah. Uh, Twilio is, I'm still figuring it out, to be honest with you. So I don't think it stops with like, okay, I'm coming in and I'm going to spend the first three months looking at how to figure out my job. Um, it's an evolving, it's an evolving role. And if you don't have a head of sales who's thinking that way, I think, you know, they're probably um, a bit too rigid or may only have singular experience like an inside sales track or SDR track or enterprise track. So always be learning. Um, we were looking very inwardly at our customer base when I arrived at the company and um, not thinking about like, well, who are the me too's in this customer base that we can go chase down? It was all very inbound. We were very fortunate. No one was hunting outbound. It was like, you know, leads were coming in and we just had to respond to them and people were picking who they wanted to call back. So we had to organize that, um, which we're still tuning today. Um, that's a really good problem to have. I've been on the other side where like 100 calls outbound and two are returned and that's you know a very different model. So um, for me, it's, it's inspection of um, one, how, is the, how are the, the executive team, how are they measuring success, how are they measuring growth, and we were measuring it in a way that was not sort of net new to me, so we had to kind of shift our, we, we've gone through an iteration of new forecasting methodology and um, new outbound targeting, those types of things. So I, I, it really depends on the situation, right? But yeah. for, for my, my inspection at Twilio, um, it was understanding how we're looking at the business today and where the gaps are. Cool. Bob, I would actually, in addressing this question, how did you figure out your role at a CEO, kind of as, as a CEO at certain stages? Um, I know it's a very broad question, <laughs> um, but for most of the founders here who are pretty early stage, um, how would you go about diagnosing, uh, diagnosing your job um, from yeah. stage to stage? Um, yeah, so the, um, you know, the, the funny thing about the CEO job is sort of looking in the rearview mirror, going from sort of zero to a thousand people, is that I realized I had three really, really different jobs. And I'll sort of stay with the uh, superhero uh, uh, comic book character analogies. The, uh, the first job was a little bit like Captain America or Wonder Woman where it's sort of like you and the platoon in the woods, sort of throwing punches, getting punched. Like, it's hand-to-hand -hand combat, and it's dirty, and it's really fun, and so you feel that esprit de corps. And in many ways, like, you're the nexus of the organization, everything sort of comes through you, and in many ways, you're kind of a project manager, because you're just trying to survive. Like, your number one job right now is don't die. Like seriously, I'm, I'm not kidding. It's don't die. Um, and then at some point, if you're fortunate, after getting product market fit where you sort of find your first 20 customers or however you get there, um, the game changes. When you start to feel acceleration, um, and then it becomes not about how, do you, how to not die, but it becomes about how do you win. And that inflection point fundamentally changes your job as a CEO. Um, the analogy I would make there is it sort of becomes a little bit more like the Avengers. You're like Captain America with the Avengers, where your job is to hire a band of superheroes, all of which have a better superpower than you. So in order to hire these superheroes, you need to let go and let them do their jobs. No grade A superhero is going to come work for you if you keep trying to do their job. So you have to let go. 
And ironically, the very things that make you successful in that sort of Captain America stage start to hold you back here. So the hardest thing I found was sort of unlearning the things that sort of worked for a while and sort of became reflex. You have to like unlearn those things. And it's really counterintuitive and actually kind of painful and creates sort of a level of insecurity about how you're going to add value in the next job. Um, interestingly, you know, that pivot between sort of survival mode and, you know, don't die mode and, oh, crap, how do we win is actually can you figure out that repeatable sales process? That is actually the inflection point. It's not can you win 10 or 20 customers. It's have you figured out your playbook? Have you figured out your playbook to repeatably find and win customers over and over again? That is a magic point in a company's life. It fundamentally changes the company and it fundamentally changes your job as a CEO. Cool. So uh, I have some more questions, but I'd actually like to pause and see, kind of open this up to the audience a little bit to see if you guys had any specific questions around your sales processes, your sales organization, your sales scaling, hiring. I have a question for Bob. You talked about three phases. You talked about two. What's the third? <laughs> oh, the third phase of the CEO role? I'll do the sales to one, too. I've been thinking a lot about this, actually. Uh, book two is actually coming out. It's going to have some of this stuff in it. So free commercial. <laughs> Woo! Um, Okay, so first CEO job is like Captain America. Uh, the second job is uh, more Avengers. like the Avengers. Yep. The third one is more like Professor Xavier in the X-Men, where you're like the dean of a university. Your teachers are the ones bringing up the next generation. And you have to do a lot less things for a lot more people and repeat yourself a lot. <laughs> Which drove me crazy, by the way. Drove me absolutely crazy. Uh, so unlearning sort of these like little memes that get wired into your head about what's adding value and not adding value. Like at that stage, your job is to be a huge signal generator to keep everybody aligned. And guess what? You gotta repeat yourself a lot. That's part of the job. But I sort of was placing judgment on myself that that was silly and people are look, looking at me going, God, you said that last week. <laughs> That's totally uninteresting. <laughs> Um, it's really important part of the job. Uh, the same thing for sales leaders. In the beginning, it's sort of Davy Crockett, then it's Joan of Arc, Braveheart, sort of the tribal warrior leader with the playbook to go run and kill the enemy. The third role is actually a really big transition for sales leaders, and very rarely do they go from two to three, which is, it's more like Eisenhower, where you have to go from the battlefield to the war room, and a little bit more of an architect and a systems thinker. You know, like Eisenhower never set foot on a, on a battlefield, right? But if you look at, like, the job, it was a very different job. And interestingly, for sales leaders, it's a really tough transition. If you talk to Mark Smith, who uh, was the VP of sales at Infoblox, Rubrik, um, uh, NetScreen, oh, crap, and uh, Arista, um, he'll talk about the hardest thing about that change is seeing your team kind of lose respect for you as you move from the battlefield to the war room. They're like, you just do PowerPoint and spreadsheets now. You're not a real sales leader, right? And you could see the relationship change with a lot of these folks that went to battle with him that started to kind of look at him differently. And he was like, that was actually interestingly one of his biggest impediments for sort of making that transition from uh, the uh, Joan of Arc role to the uh, Eisenhower role. Awesome. Next question. Back. Yeah. So how do you preserve culture as you shift through each of those stages? And how, how, how did you make sure that hi you were hiring the right people who, who believed in that culture? Uh, you guys so, you guys hiring yeah, the right people. Culture through growth. And hiring the right people. Yeah, because. Especially coming into a new, I think this would be interesting, is like coming into a new organization with an established culture and aligning yourself with that culture as well as making sure you're hiring right for that culture. Um, how do you guys, how, how have you guys kind of made sure that you have the right culture? Okay, okay. Uh, all right, I'll pipe in. So, uh, yes, painfully. Um, so, the most important thing is actually be explicit about your culture. 
Like, you can't make culture a mystery so that every new hire has to mysteriously figure out the secret decoder ring on what your company culture is. Yet a lot of companies sort of do it that way. It's like this sort of rite of passage to figure out how things work here, right? Be explicit about your culture is number one, because otherwise uh, people don't know what to do. Um, number two is uh, interview for it. You know, when you're hiring, make culture questions sort of part of the hiring process. I mean, that's sort of obvious, but it's actually harder to do than you think, particularly if you're sort of hiring an engineer or hiring a remote salesperson. Interviewing for culture fit is actually hard. Um, the third one is um, make, do a boot camp. Oracle was famous for this, that every new hire went through a boot camp where talked about, here's our culture, here's our history, here's what our product does. So I don't care whether you're in finance or sales or sales engineering, whatever, you need to know sort of how our business works and what our product does, because that's why we're here. Um, and the last one is don't be afraid that if you make a mistake and people don't fit the culture, that you have to fix that. And those, the really painful ones there are when you have a really high performer who's not a good culture fit. Those suck. We don't even use, we're not allowed to use the word culture fit anymore. Just Ooh, as a, I think oh, that's wow. a really kind of that. interesting transition in history. So our company culture, very transparent. We wear, you can look up our mission uh, or our core values. There's nine of them. Um, but yeah, culture fit is almost now regarded as like, it's a, it's a, an inclu a, it's a problem with inclusivity. Like you're trying to create Ooh, too yeah. much um, homogeneity. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Homogeneity. So we actually look for, we, we don't use the word culture fit. Um, we look for culture add. So thinking about how this, this individual is going to yeah. add to um, the culture of our company and help us think in a new way or add a new attribute that we haven't discovered yet. So I, th I think that's really, uh, it's that's not, cool. it wasn't my idea really at cool. all, but it was, I think it's a really cool thing that Twilio does. In terms of sales, we're always, we're so like metrics driven, you know, we're stack ranking everything. <laughs> we're we're uh, um, very transparent in where people are uh, if, you're, if you're running a, a high performing organization. So, you know, you see, the culture comes through that um, achievement lens, but I think the other thing that's really important is to share the priorities. We're constantly prioritizing and sharing, like this is how we're gonna get there. Re -re repetition of focus and target, um, top three things. And then holding people accountable and creating like thought leaders within your group. So there's empowerment within um, is something that I do. I, I really love when I see, you know, someone on my team sharing their, approach on a pitch and you know giving them the the floor and the credibility if they're a high performer so those types of um culture building activities i think are really effective for culture ad i i really like the culture ad piece yeah, cool. um because it also looks at so asana has a really good talk if you guys if you guys haven't seen justin rosenstein speak as culture on a pro as a product it's something that's definitely worth looking up because uh, they're very, very thoughtful looking at their culture as a product. And the culture ad piece, they look at where their weaknesses as a culture are and then solve those as a product. And that's really interesting just in the culture ad piece because then you're actually thoughtful as far as what specifically you're adding based off of the direction you want to go and what you need. So that is a great point. I love that because culture can't be rigid. One of the things that startups screw up is you sort of define your culture and then it becomes like this straight jacket. <laughs> that like can evolve, your culture will evolve and change over time. And I love this thinking about your culture as a product saying, you know, what about our culture do we not like that we need to work on? Is actually a really important question for companies to constantly be facing. Um, random other thought, by the way, completely coincidentally, relative to go-to-market, you have three totally different go-to-market models represented here. I was just thinking about that. Twilio, totally zero touch. Like now, now, now a little bit less. No, a little no, heavier definitely touch. not enterprise. Uh, like marketing led sort of medium touch and mobile iron was very much large enterprise like heavy touch. So uh, kind of interesting if there's any questions there, like this is sort of a cool spectrum of go to market models. I, uh, I 
did, I had a question I actually wanted to ask you guys. Um, and it was specifically around, um, and it, I think I can pull it back into the culture piece, is on a sales organization when you guys came in and were looking at your sales floor and what was actually needed and where the holes were in it. Um, if you were to stop and I, when you came into the organization and you lo looked for those holes, because there's holes in processes and there's holes in people um, and things that need to get filled. So if you look at that from a culture perspective in the same way of like what was, at, what was needed, like what's getting added, how did you guys go about how did you guys go about figuring out your forecasting with the obviously the numbers that we were there, but knowing what was needed from like a sales ops perspective? Like, did you need a sales ops person? Did you need an enablement person? Did you need et cetera? Well, if you want to tie it to culture, yeah, it was actually well, it very the, hard at Zendesk because the culture at Zendesk was not to fire anybody like ever. So when I came in and I had people that had been, you know, Peter principled, promoted into the wrong roles, I was like, well, I've got a, I, I have a job, I've got to make a change. So I had to make changes that the CEO didn't always agree with and I would have to answer to him as to why I made a change. Um, so I would say to you guys, it's like, as founders, you know, and I answered to him, I, you know, I, I had to, he's like, I need you to under, I need to understand right now, why did you, why did this, this person no longer here? I said, because he was recruiting other sales people off the sales floor to go join the company he's planning to join, so. I couldn't have that, so sorry, but he had to go. Um, so it was hard for me to come in and seem like the, ha you know, I didn't, not that I fired a bunch of people, but I had to make some changes. There just were people that were in the wrong roles, they were not gonna be successful, which is not good for them, it's not good for the company. Um, so that was a bit challenging, but I still did what I thought was right, and now we have the right people in the right roles. Um, in terms of looking for holes, I think it's more of like, what direction is the company trying to go in? Where are you trying to drive your product, and do you have the right type of salespeople to address that? So in my case, I think I mentioned it earlier, I had inside sales reps, and then I had nothing to address higher up market. So if I, you know, you know, I didn't have Fortune 500 companies, we do have a lot of inbound as well, we're probably similar in that regard, but I didn't have Fortune 500 companies saying, hey, I'd like to buy a thousand seats of Zendesk. <laughs> like that didn't happen. So I needed SDRs to reach out and find those projects that my marketing team was not, you know, in our messaging is still very, we're evolving our messaging, we're getting there. Um, but you know, we still have a lot of that kind of product-based um, messaging as well. So for me, it was, do I have the right type of salespeople to get where we need to get to? And we didn't. So, you know, that's where we invested a lot in the field over the last couple of years. I would say we were, we were fragmented as well. Uh, so it's kind of just bringing everyone, uh, I'm talking about sales, bringing a common methodology to measuring our success and measuring what's core and like giving, focusing on top three things. We were, we were doing a lot of different chasing all right, I, ha I can take one more question. Uh, you have not asked one yet, so. Thanks. Um, so this is a question about metrics. Um, we don't have metrics in place, clear KPIs, as for how we have done sales. We want to recruit a salesperson remotely. So if you had, if, you know, what, uh, if you have any advice as to what KPIs we could possibly use in order to uh, oversee that person, I think it depends on your inbound versus outbound to start with. Like how much, how much do you have coming at you that you need to respond to? Um, looking at how long the sales cycle is, um, what the average deal size is. So if you're trying to get a certain amount of revenue out of this rep or the salesperson, um, back down from, okay, a million dollars. Well, that's going to take, you know, however many average deal sizes, 5k, you know, you'll get a, a funnel and start building that, um, that out of the, the number you're trying to achieve. Um, and then also really look at like test, before you worry too much about that top line number and how many people you're, you need to hire to get to 20 million or whatever it is, like really look at your inbound and your outbound strategy and market fit. If it, Don't assume you can create a mid-market if there isn't a market fit for that, that type of thing. Test it. I'm gonna before. jump in here real quick. Uh, why don't you have metrics? Have you been selling as a founder? No, I'm not, no, I'm, so it's the VP of sales really who doesn't okay. have this that. Okay. So I'm speaking as a why we're him, but I'm not. Um, okay. So the VP of sales doesn't have the metrics yet. I don't think, 
I don't think so. Okay, are the, you guys using a CRM? Yes. Okay, so if things are getting... There are some metrics, but just not enough. Not enough to supervise another person, I think. Okay, so the reason I'm asking is um, you, it's really hard to manage someone and have expectations of them to perform in a way that you haven't, that you ha can't clearly understand whether they're successful or not. So that's something that your VP of sales should take some time to sit down and figure out. Like um, Mandy was talking about coming up with a plan of success. If you don't know you can set someone for, up for success, you shouldn't be hiring for that role yet. Um, and so I like, sorry, I just wanted to jump in there. I was like, if it's, if you can't set someone up for success or don't know what success looks like, you need to take the time to stop and figure it out. Like hands down period. Sorry. Yeah. Any, other, any other two cents on that one? Yeah. The, um, I'll tell you one of the other things I usually see with sort of the first one or two sales hires is, um, the traditional mindset is give them a quota, set a number. It's all about the revenue bring in revenue. I actually think that's a mistake in the very beginning. Um, it's, a, you know, bringing in deals and revenue is really important, but actually if you sort of zoom out a little bit, there's actually three things you're looking for at that stage. One is closed deals and revenue. Two is pipeline, which is potential deals that are upstream. And the third one is your playbook, which is to figure out what are the patterns of repeatable selling that are happening. So, you know, if you look at sort of how you want your first one or two sales reps or sales leaders to be spending your time, you want them to be balancing their time sort of across those three things. So figuring out sort of metrics across those three buckets or goals across those three buckets uh, is something I would suggest. There are folks that have a different school of thought. They're just like, just make a revenue number, keep it simple. Um, I happen to have a different view on it, and uh, both are probably right. Early stage, you're not optimizing for revenue. I, like, I'm sorry, VCs in the room, but like, you're not. The the names of the customers and the uh, the customer names can be really, really helpful. Like, don't try to lose a customer because you're overpricing it when that customer is the mar is becoming one of the market leaders and will drive the enterprise customers to follow. Uh, to be the fast followers. I, I think you have an, like not all VCs will think that way. They'll ask you just to go get the revenue, right? Yeah. I mean, they're not gonna be as. But there's a scalable model sensitive. behind, yeah. yeah. There's a scalable model behind if you focus on getting your first customers in place, you then, uh, you can then scale and build off of those customers. So Paul Graham has a really good saying that you, it only takes 10 customers to get to 100, and it's because each individual customer that you sell to is a spoke of other repeatable customers, and that model and use case can be repeated across it. So um, I, I'm just jumping in there as well. 